can change himself. Huh? He can change the top of the Jorge did a great job with this. So, <laughs> good morning, everybody. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Mort's Hart from Berkeley, who is going to uh, give us a fireside chat about deep learning. So, thanks, Ben. Um, I thought because it's 9 in the morning and, uh, you know, um, people might not be fully awake yet, um, I was going to talk about a little bit of um, philosophy to frame my talk. And um, the technical part of the talk is going to connect with what uh, the excellent talk that Suverit gave yesterday. I don't know where he is now. Um, and he, I just saw him like a moment ago. But yeah, so I'm going to be connecting on some of what he said and also Tenyu's talk from Monday. Um, so that's going to be the technical side of the talk. But I want to start out, while preparing the talk, it sort of occurred to me that I don't really know what world, what optimization world we actually live in and what, you know, the current uh, sort of flurry of results, what it actually suggests about uh, which of these worlds we live in. Okay, so let me give you four plausible worlds uh, that I think uh, I would like to figure out which one we're actually in. Um, and this is inspired by, um, by Impagliazzo's four worlds. Do people know Impagliazzo's worlds? Some, some of them do, the complexity theorists not. So if you haven't seen this, there's a 90, 90, uh, 1995 paper by Impagliazzo um, that I highly recommend. And I can't remember if it was uh, five worlds and two of them collapsed, or four worlds to begin with. Five, but two of them collapsed, right? Okay, so there might be collapsing worlds today. We'll see. Um, and so the first world that I think um, for a long time people assumed we're sort of in is what I call convexico. Okay? And in convexico there's sort of um, a dichotomy uh, which is that you know, learning is either um, hard or it can be, uh, can be posed as um, can be posed as a um, convex problem. <coughs> right? And I think, you know, a lot of people, maybe also in this room, up until like maybe five years ago, would have argued that we're maybe in this world. Right, Ben? I think we're still in that world. Or we might be still in that world. Okay. So, you know. Uh, so eigenvalue computation so it's somehow. No, they can be posed as convex. STP. The STP yeah. yeah. Um, I agree with you. So this was like a very compelling world because it's, it was mathematically beautiful and simple. And, uh, you know, um, it'd be nice if we were in that world. But like, it um, seems today most people are starting to believe in a world I call Gradientina, <laughs> where, um, you know, learning is either hard or it's solved by stochastic gradient descent. Okay? So learning is either. Um, Share a border? Is that what happened? There's a wall. Is it a wall? <laughs> no, let's not go there. Oh my God. Um, no walls in this talk. Territory? I'm actually not sure how. They, anyway, keep going. All right. Okay. Learning okay. is either hard. Okay. Learning is either hard or solved by SGD. Okay. And this is the world, Mari. Any example that these worlds are actually different? Yeah, that was actually also my second question. That's why that's the same. So something that um, separating these worlds, you mean? I, okay, you know, you, I don't, right? I'm not saying they're dis distinct. I'm saying here are four plausible candidates. They might collapse, as I said. You know, somebody might prove that, you know, whenever, you know, you have some nice optimization landscape, you can actually also approximate it by a convex program. And so gradientina might con con collapse to convexico. Um, but for now, for all I know, they could be different, right? And so uh, gradientina is the world where, you know, um, like we have things like, you know, optimization functions that look like this, right? Uh, where, you know, um, there is a, you know, there's a global minimum, but there are also, you know, points where the gradient vanishes or, 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 or where, like, the gradient gets very small and it's not convex. Um, but overall, you sort of, um, you can still run gradient descent. It might even be the case that, you know, you have multiple, um, you know, global minima, but they're both good, right? So they're both like with an epsilon of optimal. Okay, but you, you're not going to have these things where 
there are lots of these bad local minima that have poor value, and you might get stuck in them. Okay? And you could argue that somehow these talks that we've been seeing and all these results that have been com coming out on, you know, pseudo-convexity of this and that objective function, all the things that uh, Tengu talked about, uh, and some of the things Suver talked about, that there are evidence that we, uh, we live in uh, gradientina. Okay? Um, let me just mention two other worlds before I, you know, uh, get back to this one. Um, so I want to revisit that thought. The other two worlds, and maybe I'm not going to even going to write them out, but the other two worlds are sort of, um, you know, uh, you could call them like Optopia uh, is the next one, where, you know, there is like a yet to be discovered, you know, optimization method that's going to improve learning radically. And, uh, you know, we're not going to be doing SGD, but like a few years from now, there's going to be some other thing that um, is going to take over SGD and going to learn all sorts of problems that we currently can't learn. Okay, and I think in the, you know, and some people would argue that this is probably the world we're in, right? So if you listen to recent interviews by, say, Jeff Hinton, he says, you know, SGD has sort of run its course, and there's going to be something better that's closer to how the brain works, and that's going to solve problems that we currently can't, currently can't solve, right? And, you know, we're sort of, we've reached the limits of this paradigm, but good thing there's like some other clever optimization method that's going to replace it, and it's going to be much better. Okay? So that's Optopia. It's also plausible. And the final world uh, that, um, you know, in Pagliazzo called Pessy Land, um, what I'm going to call Messy Land, um, is that sort of learning happens for no good reason, right? It's just kind of, uh, it's going to be messy, right? There's not going to be like um, a great explanation of, you know, why deep learning works. And we're just, you know, we're trying to find an explanation where there isn't any. It's just going to be messy. And, um, you know, sometimes learning works, sometimes it doesn't. And it depends on the random seed. You have to optimize the random seed. Ben likes that a lot in reinforcement <laughs> learning when people, uh, you know, do hyperparameter search over the random seeds. Um, and so, you know, that's sort of like you could see that, you know, if reinforcement learning works, deep reinforcement learning, it might actually be sort of you know, over here in messy land where things are just really tricky and delicate and you need to uh, work really hard to get them going. But, um, you know, in principle, learning can continue to improve. It's just going to be in like a really messy way. Okay, and there's just not going to be a lot to do for theory. And so, like, I, I kind of want to get a sense by sort of show of hands uh, what people believe in, uh, you know, which world they believe in. Um, I kind of, I chose these worlds in such a way that I have a uniform prior over them. So I think they're all, uh, they're all equally likely to me. Um, so let's see, who, who here still believes in Convexico? Mahdi for sure. The theorists over there. Ben, of course. OK, good number. How, uh, who thinks we're in uh, Gradientina? Also Mahdi, he thinks they're the same. Also Ben. Um, I still don't understand how those worlds are different. Right, good point. So OK, maybe we can collapse these two worlds. Where's Marginville? What margin? Marginville. Marginville. Marginville? Okay. Um, that's a town in Optopia. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, um, who believes in Optopia? That we're, okay, see, that, there's optimists uh, everywhere, you know, that's good. And who, who uh, believes in messy land? Oh, okay. Ben, you can't just like always, you know. Uh, I'm just like, you have a uniform prior. I don't, I don't think like Convexico can be consistent with messy land. Yes, it can. Oh, really? Yeah, why? I don't know, because this seems like a very clean explanation of, you know, well, I mean, like a clean dichotomy. Same, like, do we have this, like, what do you mean by, I mean, in Messiland, like, somehow you expect us as a foundation for technology? I mean, somehow that that will work reliably and, and so, consistently? So here's sort of the, um, like, the... Uh, how the singularity would happen in messy land, right? So, um, the sing <laughs> no, 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 seriously, like uh, the, the singularity in messy land happens because you know, sort of us theoreticians run out of steam and we don't know what's going on. But good thing the machines actually start tuning themselves, and they find these like really complicated, you know, things that do something and you know continue to improve. But we just can't scrutinize them anymore and we can't understand them anymore. But they continue to improve. So is Thing you call messy lab. Okay. It's called algorithms. It's called algorithms. Okay. <laughs> in a sense, there is a special algorithm for every problem, right. which is very intricate. And there's no magic bullet. That's, that's, that's right. why, I mean, 
I think messy land, the name. Is right. So, so, but by messy land, I don't just mean like, you know, you're going to solve problems case by case. You may not even have a principled solution, right? In algorithms, you have like lots of, you know, algorithms with guarantees and, and many different principles. Um, and so, yeah, there are so many like principles that might get messy, but at least there is like in every case, there is a good explanation, right? And so maybe we're like really, you know, in this world where we, we're not going to have a good explanation. So again, um, I, just, I guess all I want to point out there, and yeah. maybe this is fine, it's like, sorry, I, maybe I missed the kind of way they seem to rule each other out, but certainly there will be a large class of things in those first two cases, and we understand a large class of things in those first two cases. And maybe there will be some other things, like a few extra special cases, which just work because people were good at alchemy. All right. But right now, for instance, like when it comes to deep learning, we don't know if deep learning, we certainly don't know if it fits in here. Um, we certainly don't know if it fits in here because we haven't even found, like, we haven't even proved that gradient descent works on natural deep learning objectives. Um, it might fit into Optopia or it fits into, you know, Messiland. So, like, when we ask, like, what does deep learning suggest, right? The, 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 this flurry of results from deep learning, you know, wh what is it evidence of? It's not clear to me. Uh, but are you talking about concrete? I mean, is, is this a statement about mathematics or is this a statement about reality? Um, I, I mean, are you talking yes, about this world in practical problems or are you talking about for well structured problems? No, you know, kind of. Um, the thing I want to sort of, ask, the question I want to ask is like the current sort of phenomenology of things. What is it, which world is it evidence of? Like what, what we're observing uh, in deep learning, right? Like both the theoretical results that, you know, people are starting to prove and the empirical success. <laughs> Which world is suggested by that? But as an observation about the world, not about the mathematical statement. It's, this is certainly not a mathematical statement. Is it possible that depending on the learning task, like if you're doing classification or something, it could be in gradient in a, for all classification problems, but when it comes to sequence learning, it could be maybe in messy point. Learning. Yeah, that's, uh, that's sort of, it, it could be that, you know. Um, you know, vision tasks are just more sort of robustly solvable, and we can solve them with provably solve them with gradient method methods. And um, you know, for sequence learning, we can't. But in that case, I would actually interpret this as evidence that probably sequence learning, when it works, can be approximated by you know either feed forward or it can be approximated by gradient methods. So I think that just sort of says something about sequence learning maybe not being as feasible as we think it is. I think right. the thing that's tricky here, and this is the part that, just going back to Pablo's comment, is, is the kind of evidence that we get from um, machine learning is not particularly scientific. So it's hard right. to wrap our heads around. I agree. Okay. All right. All right. It's just like, I did this, and I saw why. And that's right. not really a way to get to principles. Right. All right, so I want to you know, um, move on to um, sort of asking, let's say we're in Gradientina, right? And we're, um, what would sort of have to be the case for, uh, you know, for this to be a plausible world, right? I think the easiest way we could establish that we're in this world is by saying that, you know, essentially for most interesting learning problems, we don't have vanishing gradients, okay? So there are no vanishing gradients, which means that, um, you know, if for our objective function, the, um, the gradients get very small, and what was this epsilon stationarity is, I think, what Zervert called it yesterday, then, uh, you know, actually x is you know, close to optimal. Okay? So that, you know, we can always, like, reparameterize the problem or change the objective function in a way that if our gradients disappear, um, then actually we're, we're, we've solved the problem, okay? So we've gotten uh, zero training error, uh, or, or, you know, um, the objective is actually small. And so you saw from Tengu's talk, what Tengu talked about, this usually happens for, like, matrix factorization. If you optimize in a factorized space, you know, you're trying to find some <coughs> matrix factorization like this, so subject to some constraints, could be matrix completion or other things. Um, it happens for, um, to some extent, for tensor factorization. And uh, Ben Teng, you and I had a result where we showed it happens for linear dynamical systems. Uh, 
And today I want to talk about the case of residual networks. Uh, and this was, we did this, uh, this was joint work with, uh, also with Tengu from this year in iClear. And we're not going to show this for like sort of uh, non-convex, or we're not going to show this for, uh, you know, um, sort of the fully general case of residual networks. We're only going to show it in like a very special case, which are linearized um, residual networks. I'm going to tell you in a moment what those are. Okay, but like I think the the like the sort of the overarching question is, you know, what do these what do these uh, these results really tell us? Okay, so are they evidence that you know? When learning is feasible, it's actually feasible by a gradient method. Okay. So, so you're thinking of first order local optima. First order local, local optima. Okay. For now, no, no, no Hessians. Okay. So I'm, I'm going to I want to start with sort of the strongest possible claim, like you know, um, you don't have vanishing gradients. You know, you, they might vanish, and we still have a chance to uh, cope with that through you know um, there was research that Ben really likes, yeah, awesome. um, and so. Um, so there's no ICA on your list, which would be. Oh second. yeah, ICA. I guess well, you can. Second order, like, <coughs> um, yeah, or you know, even like eigenvalues have like saddle points, and you can still solve them, right? I want to be liberal in like you know including problems in this list, so you know you, you can throw an ICA and eigenvalues and so on, uh, but don't tell Ben about it. Why? Because <coughs> you know you uh, you think saddle points are not a problem. They're not a problem. Okay. There you go. Proof by invoking Ben. Oh. Yeah. Sorry? Yeah. And so anyway, so this is sort of what happened uh, in, uh, in uh, Tengu's talk, uh, you know, what Tengu talked about and gave you some uh, examples about. Um, and so, you know, these are like theoretical results people have proved. There's also been a lot of work in deep learning on the empirical side um, on avoiding vanishing gradients. Okay, and we just uh, had an exam at Berkeley where uh, everybody was asked, "Can I reveal this?" Yeah, go ahead. No, yeah, it has because we have to publish it. So yes, you have to publish it. Okay, everybody was asked, you know, um, something about vanishing gradients and what you can do about it, and uh, you know, um, the right answer was something like, "Don't use sigmoid transfer units. Use ReLUs." Okay, so uh, wow. ReLU. That was the answer. Yeah. Like it was sort of like, oh, you have a sigmoid neural network, and uh, you know, um, I'm maybe oversimplifying this a little bit, but yeah, it was basically the answer to like uh, avoiding vanishing gradients was to use values instead of sigmoids. Of um, and the other, <laughs> the other, uh, the other answer was, or you know, like one of the early papers that addressed vanishing gradients was the LSTM paper by um, Hochreiter and Schmidhuber from what '97 or something like that, something like this. So this was in the context of recurrent networks where they said, OK, we're going to do some extra circuitry called the gating mechanism that's supposed to ensure that you know, gradients don't vanish too quickly. OK? And so, um, you know, but then it also inspired a lot more recent work. There are things like batch norm that's widely used in, all, um, in, all, um, in most vision architectures. And uh, you know, batch norm can be seen as a way of trying to you know, avoid uh, vanishing gradients. And you know, empirically, certainly, I think a breakthrough was residual networks, uh, which um, you know, really did something. And you could now start to optimize things that had like 1,000 layers and, and you know, really things that you couldn't do before. OK, so deep learning can sort of be seen as uh, this very active area that you know, explores the space of how you can change the architecture, how you can change the parameterization of your problem to um, make the optimization landscape um, more benign without uh, affecting the expressivity of your model. I think that's kind of what you're trying to do there. Um, and so let me just, you know, as a warm-up example, talk about uh, values and why they don't actually avoid vanishing gradients. Um, so suppose you have some neural network and it uses, you know, these, this is a layer HL, and what the layer does, it applies a ReLU um, coordinate-wise to uh, a linear transformation A of the previous layer. OK, so sigma is just um, max with 0. So sigma x is max with 0 and coordinate-wise. OK, people understand value. Um, 
And so, uh, you know, let's say, you know, your H0 is something, it's some vector or something. So you, what do you think happens when you um, compute, like, your partial derivatives of, you know, HL with respect to some far away layer H1, let's say? People have a sense of what, what's going to happen. Backprop exercise. We can do backprop at 9 in the morning in their head. Across arbitrary number of layers. <laughs> right. Yeah, you, you do layer by layer, right? So you're going to get some like transformation for that. What's the derivative of a value? Okay. So I guess value is like 0 here and then goes up. What's the derivative? So, it's a step function, right? So you're like, it's 0 here and it's 1 there, OK? And so like this, the derivative of this uh, ReLU has the property that it, zero, it zeroes out all the negative coordinates. So whatever vector it gets, it's going to zero out all the negative coordinates. Right? And you know, like, so basically, you're going to get these products of matrices. Um, let's write this as you know, DI and AI transpose, where DI is a diagonal matrix that comes from the ReLU. And it's just the diagonal given by the indicator vector of whether HL is greater than 0. So it's going to be 1 in the coordinates that are non-negative, and it's going to be 0 in the other coordinates. Um, so this is just a diagonal matrix. And here you just right answer, right? Right. Is it, Are you oh, I don't know how they compute it. Oh, no. So the derivative is 1 if the number is greater than 0, and 0 otherwise. Right, so it's the indicator of whether the. Do you have greater than or equal to? Or you want it to be greater. Uh, it depends matter. on how you yeah. define your value. I don't know which one. Uh, either I'm fine either way. This one doesn't matter. Right, you can make it strictly positive. Okay, so you get these diagonal matrices, which is zero out some of your coordinates, namely all the negative ones, and you, you just have a linear transformation, right, and some other stuff. Okay, but basically you get this chain of linear operations, uh, a diagonal operation that zeroes out all the negative <laughs> coordinates and just a, a, a linear operation. And so now suppose your AI is just a, a random Gaussian matrix or a random rotation or something like that. So it's always going to make half of the coordinate zero, uh, a negative, right? So you start with an arbitrary vector. And you know, let's say this is a rotation matrix. So it looks like this uh, for some randomly chosen basis u. Let's say it's just a rotation. So it's going to take any vector, and it's going to rotate it randomly such that half the coordinates become negative, right? Is that your understanding of a rotation, random rotation? I don't know why you wrote it as a low rank matrix. <coughs> it's a full rank matrix. It's just a random rotation. You have that equal act, is that what you're saying? Um, <coughs> Wait, if you apply a random rotation to a vector, you, you don't get zeros, right? You don't get zeros. You get negative coordinates, right? Oh, right? So if you apply a random rotation to a vector, half of the coordinates become negative. I, I think it's what you wrote is not what you want. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Whatever. Um, random rotation. We get yeah, random rotation. Yes. Um, and so, uh, so if you apply random rotation to a vector, half the coordinates become negative. So half of the norm is going to be in the negative uh, part. And so half of the norm is going to get zeroed out by this DI operation. Right? So at every step of this chain of linear operations, you decrease the norm by a factor of 2. OK, so ReLU networks actually are sort of the definition of vanishing gradients. It's like at every, at every layer, you slash the norm by a factor of 2. So you have k layers, and the norm goes from you know, 1 to 2 to the negative k. Okay, so ReLUs don't actually address vanishing gradients. Okay, but we're going to see that, uh, you know, I'm trying, going to try to convince you that uh, in this talk that residual networks actually do um, seem to avoid them, uh, both in, in theory and in experiment. So is there a wiper? So let me tell you about Yeah. But that's, a, that's not a very strong argument, right? I mean, I could multiply the radio by 2. Right? Sorry? I mean, I could multiply your radio by 2, and, I don't know, and then you would not have this problem. Right. Like, right. But, but then you have exploding gradients, right? Right, yeah, like you, you need to sort of, right. I mean, what I'm saying is it's not, it's not, it doesn't prove that you're vanishing gradients, but it, it, like, it remains sort of something you need to worry about, right? Like, even if you just randomly initialize your matrices, at initialization, it's already a problem. But yeah, I agree. It can be like addressed with scaling and, and renormalization. That's why you know, people couple it with batch norm, and then this kind of goes away. And you know, there are ways of coping. It, but, but a greater worry is the randomness, right? I mean, definitely, if 
all uh, at the same level, the rows of A will not all be independent. Gate right, but like at every at every step, you get a fresh transformation, right? So it doesn't. But yeah, once you run gradient descent, you do correlate them. Yeah. I agree with that. But like for now, even like even in the choice of weights of the network, it may not be it may, may not be random. It may be Everybody initializes at random. Oh, I see. The starting point. So the starting, so point, the starting point, point is random. Let's just consider a starting point. Once you run gradient descent, you're going to correlate things weirdly. <coughs> but it's stuck at the spot. yeah, it's even stuck. Or at the start, even like things are going to get small unless you do something else about it, right? But values alone are not going to do the trick. OK? Um, so let me talk about residual networks. So how do residual networks try to address this problem? Man, this really doesn't work. I can't work with a wiper like this. There's another one right there. Maybe the other erasers. You need a better eraser. OK, anyway. So let's talk about residual networks. How many people have heard that term before? About half, probably. Um, so the idea in a residu residual network is that if you have something deep, if you have like a composition of many layers, you're going to try to like make every layer be close to the identity. OK? So if you saw this, you know, where was our previous description? This was sort of a standard network. You applied some nonlinearity to some uh, you know, uh, linear transformation at every step. In a residual network, what you would do is HL would look like this. It would, you know, again, do the same thing, apply nonlinearity to like a linear transformation of the previous layer. <coughs> but it would also preserve the previous layer by just adding it back in. OK, let's say these, these are all dimension preserving. This linear transformation is dimension preserving. What it's going to do is it's just going to apply this, the circuitry to the previous layer, but it's also going to um, you know, preserve the previous layer by just adding it in. OK, so pictorially, you have your HL layer, HL minus one layer, and you're just going to copy it. And here you apply some circuitry to it, um, you know, some circuit. And now you're just going to add it. OK, this is sort of what it looks like for a residual network. OK, and this makes a lot of sense to me because now, locally, everything is kind of well conditioned. OK, locally, everything is close to the identity. Every single transformation that you do is just a small change of uh, the identity, assuming this is sort of small norm. OK, and this is usually how you parameterize these things. OK, so you're going to say, look, if you have a, a network with like a thousand layers, it'd be really unfortunate if like the uh, last layer you know, did this radical transformation of the input, right? So let's just like, you know, we probably already have a good transformation. Let's just change it a little bit, okay? Let's be conservative in how we uh, change our transformation, uh, our representation. Yeah. In the case of recurrent neural networks, there's weight sharing, right? So this right. example doesn't uh, tell you that results are bad for that. Um, the AIs are not independent, they are the same. For, for like, if, if this is like the, according to the, you know, depth of a, uh, or an unrolled, uh, yeah. But a similar argument is also, would also work. Yeah. Is it important that you maintain this dampening throughout running gradient descent? Or is it, would it be equivalent to just think of initializing the network instead of random rotations? I just initialize to identity plus a small random rotation. Very good, very good. So in, in the linear case, that's, those are equivalent. Very good, very good observation. Um, so, like, if you don't have a nonlinearity here, let's say you know you just have a linear transformation, no nonlinearity, then your observation is absolutely right. Uh, it's actually it's that you're applying the nonlinearity only to the transform. That's right. That's right. Uh, okay. If you if you didn't have a nonlinearity here, it would just be a different way of initializing the network, and exactly in the way you said, by initializing it close to the identity instead of just close to zero. Okay. Yeah, so um, let me also mention for completeness, this is not usually the building block you have. Usually the building block you have looks more like this. You have two linear transformations, u and a ReLU in the middle and a v here. Um, this is the most common building block, and maybe there's a bias term here, and there's another bias term here. But basically, you know, it's the same idea. You have some circuit here, uh, some circuitry. But in the end, you preserve the previous layer. Okay. So I'm going to ignore this for the moment. Um, and so what we're going to analyze is actually not the, this general case where you have nonlinearities. We're going to be very, um, you know, um, 
um, a lot less ambitious in this talk. Uh, and we're just going to analyze the linear case where you know, I remove the sigma. So I just have HL minus 1 plus sigma times, uh, sorry, no sigma, times AL times HL minus 1, F plus AL times HL minus 1. Okay? And so the whole model can just be written as uh, a composition of matrices like this. Okay, so my uh, whole problem or my whole architecture just becomes a chain of linear operations um, where each operation is close to the identity. So in the linear case, I just parameterize you know, a linear map in a weird way, in this like, extremely redundant way. Okay? So I have you know, uh, L operations instead of just one, and each of them is close to the identity. So it, not very small, right? So let me tell you what small means. Um, which one was the good one? This one. Uh, they're the same, just one is closer. Huh? They're the same, just one is closer to you. They might not be the same. Ben claims this one is better. Look at that. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Totally a different game. <laughs> not my ID. <laughs> yeah, just sort of as a sanity check that we're sort of on the right track. Imagine we try to do this argument uh, for uh, residual networks. In that case, what you would get is you get a product of transformations like this, some diagonal matrix times some linear transformation. And of course, this doesn't have the issue. It's not, it doesn't shrink the norm. It preserves the norm roughly. Okay, so at least as a sanity check, it avoids the issue that I pointed out with ReLU networks. All right. And so we can study, um, with this linear version of the problem, we can study a regression problem where I'm trying to learn a linear map <coughs> R from you know, Rd to Rd. And my problem looks something like this. I want to uh, you know, minimize you know, Rx. Let's see, let's write it like this. I want to minimize y minus y hat in the squared norm, where y is just equal to rx plus some noise, and y hat is equal to my residual model. Times x, and I assume that x, y are drawn from, uh, sorry, I assume that x is drawn from some distribution. Um, some distribution with covariance matrix sigma doesn't have to be. That's the only thing I'm going to assume is that you know, I have the I know the covariance matrix sigma, and the noise is Gaussian. Okay, so I'm just considering a standard least squares regression problem where I parameterize my model, my linear model, to be of this residual shape. Does that make sense? The problem definition. So now let me ask the sort of obvious question: Is this a convex problem? And so I'm minimizing over these matrices A L up to A one. Is this problem convex? Now this sort of looks convex, right? Because I have the squared loss here, but then if you look at my model parameters, they actually come in this really weird factored shape. So R is three squared, right? R is fixed, yeah. And the A1 to A variable. That's right. <coughs> These are my variables. AL through A1 are my variables. You can re-parameterize it to be convex. Sorry? You can re-parameterize it. That's right. That's right. That's, uh, sorry, what? There's a nice re-parameterization that makes it nice and convex. Of course, yeah. I could just have a single linear transformation. It's a, you know, I'm solving a toy problem, right? It's a, like I could just replace this by a single linear transformation and it becomes convex. That's certainly true. What is capital D again? Capital D is just some distribution. Um, just some, X is just drawn from some distribution with covariance sigma. 
so nothing prevents you from setting all the a's to zero except one and set that uh, one i plus a one to r. Right. So you know, I'm going to introduce like a sort of a norm constraint. I'm going to restrict the spectral norm to be less than a half, let's say. And at this point, it's not even clearer that I can, you know, express R, right? So let me tell you uh, under what circumstances you can express R. And this is just kind of some matrix algebra, which uh, probably most of you will um, be able to uh, see. So uh, suppose R is PSD. And I want to write R as a product of many things close to the identity. Let's say the spectral norm of R is equal to 1. And it's PSD. How can I write this as a, you know, as a uh, product of L matrices that are each close to the identity? Take a bunch of roots. Yeah, so I could, for example, set AI equal to, uh, you know, R, the lth root of R minus the identity. Right? This would do the trick. But it's not unique, right? I could, for example, set A1 equal to like 2 over L minus I and then compensate for it in the other transformations, right? So just as a remark, it's not, it's not like there's a unique solution here. But there is a solution in which, uh, you know, if I said like this, the spectral norm of AI is order 1 over L, right? And so this is true even in, in general for any linear transformation R, I can actually express it in such a way, I can express it as a product of L things that are each close to the identity, and by close I mean order 1 over L. So in principle I don't even need half here, I could just use 1 over L. But the positive definite assumption is Right, so I can remove that, right? So the proof just gets a little bit more difficult, but I can, I can remove that. It's, uh, it's just the proof is obvious for positive definite, and it's less obvious for general matrices. OK, so yeah, I mean, nobody has said that yet, but I think we agree that this is not obviously convex, right? Um, because, uh, you know, you have this factored space, right? It's sort of like a matrix factorization problem, and you kind of have a deep factorization um, where uh, you have all these different terms. And so this, this objective is actually not convex. You can check. So is it true that you can assume the AIs are all uh, commuting with R? I mean, they, they have the, you might as well assume that. I, don't, I think that's going to make it hard. That's too strong an assumption, yeah. In general, because you're going to initialize these randomly or, or, or something, and so you're then not going to have the same basis as no, eigenbases as R. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, and that's that's how you're going to prove that. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Right, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. So, OK, this is not convex, but it's actually you know, fairly close to convex. And uh, it's you know, close to convex in the sense that it doesn't have vanishing gradients. OK, so let me state the exact theorem. So the theorem is the following. Let, I first have to define a region over which I think uh, the gradients don't vanish. So I'll call that B sub tau. And B sub tau is just the region where uh, you know, the max of AI, so it's just the a1 up to AL, all the A1s up to AL, where the max norm of any of them is bounded by 1 over t uh, by tau. OK, so this is my domain. And over this region, I can argue that um, any critical point inside B sub tau uh, must also be a global minimum. And moreover, I can give you an expression for how large the gradient is over this domain. And the gradient norm is going to be 
Let me write as by A, I'll just denote the whole parameter set, A1 to AL. I'll just denote that, that by A. Um, I can lower bound the Frobenius norm of this tensor by 4L times 1 minus tau to the 2L minus 2 times the smallest eigenvalue of the covariance matrix of the input distribution. You can ignore that if you want for now. Uh, and then just how far I'm away from the optimum. So f of a minus c of opt, where this is the optimal solution. And I guess I should call this, this is the objective function. So I'll call that f of a. And I'll call this whole set of parameters a. OK? So let, let's interpret this real quick. Uh, if tau is something like 1 over L, then one, one over, you get 1 minus 1 over L to the L. So that's a constant times L. And so this basically, like in the normal regime where tau is equal to 1 over L, this is basically like omega of, let's also say the conditioning is, is, is good. So this is just omega of L times um, or it is omega of f of a minus c opt. Okay. So it just lower bounds the gradient norm by how far you're away from the optimum. And so the only way the gradient norm can get small is if you're actually close to the optimum. Is that theorem statement clear? Pablo. When you compare this, will you have different <laughs> I mean, you're really changing the region. You're changing the parameter region. That's right. So somehow, how should I compare this with the I mean, it's a different problem, right? That's, that's exactly right. And I think that's the game you're playing in, in, in deep learning, that you're changing the problem, right? You, you're not solving sort of. What is the expressive power of this? So the, so the expressive power in this case is the same. I can express any so linear map. You have your constraint, right? But, the but I, I just argued that I can express any linear map. So it's the same expressivity. I don't lose. It has, like, in this linear setting, it has full expressivity. I can, exp I can, like, I just argued, maybe I should have written this as a lemma, but. Oh, if you're leaving up, sure. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's right. actually how these work. You just make them big. Right. That's right. So, yeah, for, for, like, if I have only two things, I couldn't express anything. But, like, the game in the residual networks is that you make everything close to your identity, but you compensate for it by making it deep. How many layers? Thousands, thousands of layers. Thousands of layers. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know, uh, but um, yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. We're changing the problem, and that's that's the whole point. You know, we're not solving sort of the problem that might have bad critical points. We're we're going to a different problem. Okay, and so actually, um, you can rewrite the subjective function a little bit. That's kind of a simple lemma, and then the proof is almost over. How much time do I have, by the way? I'm out of time? Really? Yeah. Okay, so. So I'm the chair, I just make up rules. But yes, you're out of time. Oh, no. <laughs> okay, so you can, let me just finish it off. So you can really uh, easily rewrite the objective function as something that doesn't have any randomness inside. So it just becomes your, your linear transformation, i plus al uh, up to i plus a1 minus r. And I'm going to ignore the. Uh, the uh, sigma matrix for now plus some constant. Okay, so you can get rid of the randomness and just write it as how close are these linear transformations in Frobenius norm? This is your model. This is what you're trying to learn. How close are they in Frobenius norm? So this is just equality, and it really simplifies the uh, you know objective function. And once you have that, the proof is really over because you just compute the gradients of this thing, and uh, they you know you can really read off exactly what's going on. So if I compute the you know, the gradient of f with respect to the ith uh, matrix, what I get is just the following expression. It's just 2 times the identity plus a i plus 1 transposed up to i plus a l transposed. Now comes my error matrix E, and this is just this guy. How close am I? It's my error matrix. Call that E. So you multiply all these transformations by E, and now you trans uh, multiply them from the right by I plus A1 transpose up to I plus A 
I minus 1 transpose. Okay? And you know, you don't really have to verify whether this is true, but the only thing I want to remark is here is your error matrix. This is what you're trying to minimize, right? And here you have a bunch of invertible linear transformations. Okay? So the only way, because all of these are close to the identity, this is 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 close to the identity, the only way that the gradient can vanish is if the error term is zero. So you just stare at this, uh, at this expression and, you know, this has the smallest eigenvalue of this guy is 1 minus 1 over tau, or 1 minus 1 over L. The smallest eigenvalue of this transformation is 1 minus 1 over L. And same for all the others. And so the only thing that can vanish, like if you want your gradient to be 0, the only, thing you, the only way you can make that happen is by setting E to, to be 0. And that's it. That's the whole purpose. I'm missing something, obviously. So the, the restatement, it's completely symmetric with respect to the AIs, right? So why is it that you get symmetric to uh, with respect? Not. What do you mean symmetric with respect to the AS? Any permutation of the AI. There's no sequ it, it, sequentiality, right? I mean, it, huh? They don't commute. They don't commute. This is a matrix oh, product. I'm sorry. Right. Yeah, so the order is, you can't, you know, they don't commute. But the only point is, if you write down the gradient of this thing, you get something that can only vanish if the error term is zero. That's all. I'm now really out of time. Okay. okay. Thanks. One more question. That's good in the drag. Go ahead, Rob. I mean, don't you get the Fabian's normal P out of the expression, and there you only affect the normal? Mode? Uh, where was the spectral norm? I, I meant Frobenius. So Frobenius norm of this whole thing, right? Yeah, so if you compute the Frobenius norm of the, uh, this thing, right, then you can lower bound this as sort of all these sigma mins, right? Yeah, sigma min of the AI, I agree. But you, right, you can lower bound this as this right? times the Frobenius norm of E. So that's even better than what you have? I mean, you only have this. Uh, what did I write? What, what yeah, a, sigma min of, it doesn't matter. I mean, you, you have the least are, sigma, but maybe. It's oh, this is the covariance matrix, not E. Uh, I, I, I removed the covariance matrix. Um, I just assumed it's identity for notation. Let me just ask kind of a concluding question. Uh, so, I mean, from what you present, it looks like the conclusion is that, you know, you believe more in Gradientina, saying that you can no. take a problem and modify it so that gradient descent finds. No. Oh, so I, this is, I guess if I had more time, I would have reflected on what this tells us. But um, so yeah, does this like, sort of the question is, most people interpret these kind of theorems as evidence for uh, gradientina. But I don't actually believe that's true because um, they don't actually get at learning, right? So these are just optimization results that talk about critical points. And they don't actually talk about learning at all. They don't talk about generalization. They tell you nothing about learning. So in some sense, these, these results are, you know, at the very best sort of circumstantial evidence for this world. But it's like completely consistent, in my opinion, with also messy land or any other of these worlds. So I don't think these results actually tell us much. That's a great way. <laughs> <laughs>